Don, uh, welcome again. This is what I'm so, I'm interested in. I want to see your take on it. I'm a Brit, so I'm always up for the Brits saying, you're king of the world. But the Americans, at one point, dominated the world, especially when it came to Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, Olympic gold. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yes, you'll, you'll be able to pick out, pick out one or two, and, and the outstanding ones mm -hmm. have predominantly been American. Mm -hmm. But as time has gone on, the, mm -hmm. the goal tally in America when it comes to Olympic boxing has, has dwindled. Could you take me through, through the, 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 the birth, the heyday, and the, 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 the dwindling of, of why, of the, of, of the champions and why that happened? Yeah, it's, you know, it's sort of an interesting reversal how history does repeat itself. When the Olympics started, you know, in the 1890s, so there wasn't any boxing. It didn't come until 1904. And at that point, I think Britain won all the medals. And then the next Olympiad, the, the Americans won all the medals. But nobody went on to any distinguished careers of pro. It was basically amateur boxing was amateur boxing and pro boxing was pro boxing. So you had guys like Harry Greb turning pro with six pro fights or people like Benny Leonard turning pro at 14, 15, they'd have a chance to go into Olympics. As amateur boxing developed in the United States, and we came a lot after Britain did with the ABAs and things like that, you had you know, more of a, a place where young kids could learn the fundamentals before turning professional. So the Olympics got more prominent. And it's interesting, up until 1948, uh, we only had three boxers, well, 48, you include Pascual Perez and Argentinian. There were only four boxers who won gold medals and went on to become world champs. Frankie Gennaro, 1920, Fidel LaBarbin, 24, and Jackie Fields, who became well away champ, and then Pascual Perez in Argentinian, 48. Oh, yeah. I, right? But I think the stimulation was television. When television came in, these guys would be instant celebrities. Floyd Patterson, he fought, I believe, was in Helsinki and won the gold medal. And obviously, they took the film of that. They didn't have Telstar satellite for uh, you know simultaneous transmission. And by the next couple of days, he was on home TV, the, the film of his fight in Olympics were reaching millions of people. So when Olympian turned pro, he was already a celebrity. You don't have to go through a 25 build up and take him around, publicize him. He was, you know, he was pre-stamped, pre-ordained to be a, a top fighter. And then you went from Patterson in 52 and then 56, Jose Torres was in the Olympics as an American and won a, a medal, not a goal, but a medal. And, and 60, of course, Muhammad Ali, who was then Cassius Clay, 64, Joe Frazier, 68, Foreman, 72, uh, we didn't have a gold medalist, but we had John Tate, who I think won a silver or bronze, went on to be WBA champ. 76 produced two future heavyweight champs, and uh, Leon and uh, Michael Spinks, who won gold medals in two different divisions. And then we go into Holyfield and Ray Mercer, and, you know, it was sort of a rite of passage. It was, you, if you didn't win an Olympic gold medal, the chances of you becoming a world champion were much diminished. Uh, so it be, you know, everybody was a good fighter and then it went to other divisions, you know, had Ray Leonard and you had Oscar De La Hoya. And if you won a gold medal, John, you were nurtured. You weren't going to come be come out and be thrown in with guys with 20 or 30 fights. You were then an instant celebrity. The promoters knew that you were a commodity and you were taken along and built into being a contender and getting a definite shot for the world title. Uh, so it, it went from really the Olympics were a secondary thing. If you won it, it's fine, but you certainly didn't have to win it to be a world champ as Dempsey didn't, as Lewis didn't, as Robinson didn't. Uh, and then starting about 1952 with Patterson, the advent of TV, it became part and parcel of a career. You were almost, you were guaranteed if you won a gold medal to get a world title fight. You know, that just seemed to be rite of passage. Uh, the most extreme example is Pete Rademacher was the gold medalist in the heavyweight division, 1956. And his first professional fight, he fought Floyd Patterson. That shows the power of the gold medal, John, and the television that, that, that broadcast that, that he was well enough known, even though everybody decried the match as a mismatch, that, but he could still step up and box for the world title in his first professional fight. Would you class that as one of the most probably... Who's probably one of the most underachievers in the gold medal, gold medal, gold medalist, American gold medalist? Mm, you know, let as me, a professional. Right. Yeah. I mean, there was a fella, Ed Saunders, in 52 when Patterson uh, boxed and he won, I believe he won the heavyweight title, Ingemar Johansson, and just didn't pan out. He died relatively young. Uh, but again, they have achieved, uh, I, I tell you one, Henry Tillman. He was the, and awesome. I, I really yeah. right. He was a gold medalist in what was the heavyweight, then they created super heavyweight. And he had beaten Mike Tyson as an amateur. And uh, he didn't pan out. In fact, Tyson finally got revenge on him and boxed him as a pro, knocked him out in one round. 
but he was an aberration. As I said, you were pretty much geared into getting a fight for the title. If he just were an Olympic medalist, especially an American, as you recall, Evander Holifield did not win gold, but he had enough notoriety in a controversial decision that he lost to go out and parlay that into a, you know, a world title, as did Roy Jones. So the exceptions, the Tillmans, I think, are the exceptions rather than the rule as we go you know, down, down the track. And they have some, outstand, some, some, some outstanding uh, amateurs that had depth mm -hmm. in their career. Then you, look, then you look at fighters like George Foreman. I only had, what was it, 18 amateur fights before he picked up gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. there's, a, a, there's such a massive gulf. But to go on to be one of the top five um, um, uh, in Olympic gold medalists and, and, and world champions as well, I mm -hmm. think the line, the line when uh, uh, Arle, Ray Leonard, uh, Arlie, mm -hmm. um, Foreman, Lewis, mm -hmm. uh, Klitschko, obviously, but not American. So, mm -hmm. what, what what has changed? Is it is it choice? Is it is it opportunity? Is it face not fitting? Why 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 the decline as the years of the, the, the decline of dominance yeah. deteriorated? Uh, you know, I, well, there's been so much corruption. I have a saying that, you know, amateur boxing is run by professionals and professional boxing is run by amateurs. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right? Well, the corruption was so ingrained. I'll tell you whether you remember this. We had the Cold War going on and, and the Cold War outside of fighting it out with guns and, and, and spies, you could do it through sports. You know, the Americans versus the Russians or the Eastern Bloc versus Western Europe, pretty much what's going on today with Russia and the crazy ideas. But we, so there was always that great competition and the Cubans came a little bit later. But what the Russians were doing is, and, and, or, or the, the, the communist bloc, they were subsidizing their fighters. They weren't getting millions like Americans could potentially get or British fighters, or European fighters, but they were leaving much more comfortable lives than the average Pole or Russian or, or Ukraine. Well, the Russian Soviets then, but people in the, you know, Bulgaria, they were celebrities and yet all the revenue they would get would go back to the government. So if a guy in Russia was a terrific fighter and he was drawing 15,000 people in an arena, he might be getting $100,000 a year salary, which is great for them. But all that revenue, the TV revenue, the live gate revenue, the sponsorship was making fortunes for promoters. So it'd be like John, you fighting or any great, imagine Tyson Fury fighting the other day with a Dillian White fight. He gets a decent pay, but all the money goes to the government. So and say, we're going to get a million or half a million, which is good, but the 30 million is going to the government and they were getting rich when the Soviet Union fell and it became, you know, capitalist society and the click shows and these kind of fights. Now I want to get paid what I'm worth. Amateur boxing collapsed there. And I think that the rivalry between the U.S. and Russia sort of collapsed. And these guys were using the amateurs like Americans do, you know, at British fights to learn how to box, to get the fundamentals, to get the publicity from winning a gold medal or amateur titles, but then making the real money is pros. And I think that hurt the amateur boxing. It hurt it in, in, the, in the East because the fighters were not staying there. You know, they would have 300, 400 fights. We have Lomachenko, probably the last vestige of that where a guy would have three or 400 amateur fights. It's inconceivable happening in Britain or the United States. And so I think afterwards, um, why American decline, I think that great rivalry started to go out of there. So it wasn't as the impactful. And I think a change in people's attitudes, maybe to the, the amateur boxing programs in the United States declined a great deal. Uh, we had in New York for a hundred years, the PAL, the Police Athletic League, which would grind out fighters, even if they weren't champions. Ray Robinson and Rocky Graziano, Jake LaMotta were famously, you know, byproducts of that system. And that collapsed. The urban, you know, the, the urban environments that produced all these fighters, less and less. So uh, the interest in the Olympics started to wane. And then the bad decisions. You remember the Roy Jones and people felt Mala uh, there was a malaise. And I think the credibility of the Olympics and the credibility of amateur boxing just kept going down. When I was a young man, it was a rite of pay. every kid, whether it was Don Majeski or guys who went on to Mark Breland. You would go into the uh, Golden Globe. You'd sign up. You may not even participate. It was like a rite of passage. And it was like for an American 41, everybody signed up to go into the army at the Pearl Harbor. It united the country. And every young kid in New York, every young boy, 16, go for the Golden Gloves. There were 200 applicants you know, for each division. It was unbelievable. And uh, that, that sort of passed on. You know, it, it became no longer a tradition. It became, went out of the culture. So I think the support became less. I think the amateur boxing became less interesting for people for whatever reason. Other sports like 
martial arts like Taekwondo and, 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 and things like, uh, you know, UFC kind of sports, mixed martial arts took precedent. I can go in my neighborhood. I don't know how it is where you are, but you can see a lot more jujitsu gyms and, and martial arts gyms than you see pure boxing gyms where young people just go into box whether they want to have a career or not. It's sort of lost its influence. And then when the scandals came, if you recall, John, they were having this thing. When the Soviet Union fell, when the Eastern Bloc fell, there was no revenue. The Cubans, all these people, they needed revenue. So what did they do? They started to charge people to get into the Olympics. They, they, they started to say, if you want to get in the Olympics, you have to sign with us. And they wanted to start like a professional promotional group, the people who were on the Olympic Committee. And that, you know, sort of blew out very quickly. Professional boxing promoters know their business. They don't want more competition. But just the underlying idea of corruption to the point where I believe, John, if I'm not mistaken, they have canceled the Olympics for 20, boxing in the Olympics for 2024. So they weed out this corruption that got so bad. That's so sad because, you, as you say, the professional game is run by the amateurs and the amateurs is, is run by a professional outfit uh, to keep it that way, to keep... And maybe that's why our sport has probably suffered up to date mm -hmm. uh, because companies, I mean, legitimate companies, I don't know, like Coca-Cola and, and, mm -hmm. and Nike, people, they don't really want to get involved in mm -hmm. boxing or, or back in boxing because of the reputation mm -hmm. it once had. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, would I know the Mafia was very heavily involved in boxing uh, back in the 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. Was that the same for the amateurs as well? Well, I think they had their own Mafia. I wouldn't say it's organized crime, but you know, the way these people, you have autocratic countries. So where was this coming from? Places like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, their, their whole system is based on corruption. As you see in modern day Russia, if you're reading about Putin, how these oligarchs made billions with him, you know, these huge $150 million yachts. And I think their thinking process is totally different than us. You know, they just, everything's based on corruption. So when they couldn't make it any more legally, where whether it was legal, exploiting the athletes, they needed a way, a revenue source. So they just took over the amateur boxing, like it might've been with the mafia in America in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, and, and they impose their will. I mean, imagine a kid, you go in and they say, you want to box in the Olympics? You got to sign with our company if you turn pro. And that's what was happening. I mean, we have this saying, Simon Pure. And everybody looked at the amateurs. Oh, they're in, we just want to watch amateur boxing. They're incorruptible. Come to find out they're more corrupt than anything in boxing. <laughs> you know? And there's never been, John, a direct link between amateur boxing, pro boxing. I don't know how it worked with football. We call it soccer here. But in America, let's say you're in the, a basketball player, or you're a football player, even a baseball player as an amateur, we call it, you come from college or high school, they have an annual draft. Well, these guys are getting drafted by teams and they negotiate $100 million contracts when they turn professional. They're making millions before they play a game. In pro boxing, there's nothing where you say, all right, we're going to have a draft for the Olympics. So every promoter doesn't have to individually negotiate. They can bid on these fighters. So let's say you have the ABA finals. At the end of every year, all the ABA winners, promoters bid on your services. Not just, I'm going to sign with John, I'll convince him and I'm competing. But you have like an open bidding, which is, we've never had that link between amateur boxing and... and, and that, that, that's a shame. And that makes actually makes more sense as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to put, to tidy up our sport. But again, individuals benefit. Mm -hmm. So when, when they said promoters all over the world, not just in America and not this year mm -hmm. in the UK, all over the world, mm -hmm. when they see something like this, that's going to affect their business, mm -hmm. they'll get their club together to mm -hmm. say, no, 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 we don't want this, which, mm -hmm. is, which is such a shame because, mm -hmm. as you said earlier, we seem to shoot ourselves in the foot, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with, with our sport itself, with, with, with American Olympics, you know, they've actually all of us have started to try to nurture back yeah. Olympians that are top draw, and mm -hmm. that will take time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, is, it is such a shame. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, Don, who would you put down as your top five gold medalist? Wow. Americans that mm -hmm. went on to do well as professional, in your wow. opinion? Uh, well, I mean, you know, you've luck. Uh, again, this would be probably the post, uh, it had to be post 1950s. Well, Ali is the one that stands out, I think, as much yeah. as anybody. Yeah. But, but, but people don't realize Ali actually didn't win a heavyweight, he won light heavyweight. Right. Yes, he did. Uh, they, they seem to not realize. No, that's right. And you say the heavyweight who won in that 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 time period is completely forgotten today. You know, I'd have to look him up to, to tell you who it was. So there's another guy didn't pan out. Yeah, and Floyd Patterson actually was a middleweight. 
and went on to become mm -hmm. a heavyweight champ. And Michael Spinks was not the heavyweight, nor was uh, Evander Holyfield. So they matured into that division. The guy who won the heavyweight title, I was a super heavyweight, was Tyrell Biggs, and then Henry Tillman, and then third, basically oh. super middleweight, oh. which today was Holyfield. So he yeah. grew into a heavier division. So for us, you know, of course, Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Floyd Patterson, because he really was the first and become world champ at 21, 22 years of age, a phenomenal achievement. Uh, George Foreman uh, and the Sphinx brothers, I think they were so remarkable. You know, I think they were the greatest fighters to come out of it. And then you have so many others, you know, after Os obviously Oscar De La Hoya, Floyd Mayweather, you know, and uh, Roy Jones did not want a gold medal yet. What catches my, my, what caught my attention in looking through this, again, I mentioned earlier on that George Foreman had only had 18 professional fights. Mm -hmm. But so by the time he turned professional, he was still learning on the job. So mm -hmm. by the time he got in with the likes of Ali, he was making big rookie mistakes mm -hmm. uh, that you'd expect a, a, an 18-year-old to make. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was learning on the job. Mm -hmm. That sounds very similar to our own Anthony Joshua, yeah. who turned professional at 18. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, achieved amazing things, which says the George Formers and the Anthony Joshua's of this world are amazing athletes yeah. to do what they did and achieve yeah. what they've achieved, yes. and with, with so little experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I suppose originally the amateurs were actually geared towards preparing you for the professional ranks. Yeah. I think that Anthony Joshua, to a degree, maybe Foreman, when we saw him lose to Ali, although they went on to become a greater fighter, maybe even after he lost to Ali, were victims of their own success. That Joshua winning that medal, and, and in Britain, it was such an amazing thing <clears throat> that he was popularity was so great that he had to fight professional and maybe rushed into it quickly before he really had matured as a fighter with enough experience to sustain. I mean, it was phenomenally, <clears throat> in terms of Ability as opposed to money, uh, money made by in, 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 in respect to his ability, I think there was no fighter more successful than Joshua. Yeah. And not to say he didn't deserve it, but he was so popular, 60, 80,000 people against ordinary opponents. It was absolutely incredible. But maybe instead of rushing in, he might have needed two more years as an amateur you know, to, to really mature and might have been a much better fighter. Not that he wasn't financially successful, but now we're talking as a fan. Well, we're going to beat Joe Lewis and we beat Ali. You know, <clears throat> Ali had 100 amateur fights. He was really, and started fighting when he was 12. So he's really groomed. He was prepared for everything. He knew everything. He knew how to fight. Which, which, which makes, makes you realize and understand the feet of, of your foremans, of your, of, your, of your Joshuas. Because mm -hmm. usually the stage they, they picked up a gold medal. Mm -hmm. It's usually the, the people that have invested their life from the age of 10, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. to get to that stage these guys did it in the first two or three years of mm -hmm. actually actually boxing and mm -hmm. so you unfortunately for them they had to be judged learn on the job so if they failed or if they boxed amazingly they're right. going to be critiqued mm -hmm. uh, as though as though they were still amateurs yes. uh, and sometimes george and, and, and aj have, have been probably naive in some of the things they've said mm -hmm. because they just didn't know mm -hmm. uh, they just they just hadn't been it did they, they hadn't born with the job born with a job Mm -hmm. So, Lennox Lewis, of course, Lennox Lewis's achievements were second to none. I don't know how you look at it. Is Lennox Canadian? Is he British? Yeah, uh, whatever he was, it? yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> claims him when he was winning. Everybody denied him when he was losing. That was the thing, yeah. That, that's, that's the story of the game. That's the story of the game. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so, upcoming uh, potential Olympians, ones you'd look out for, who would you, uh, you were American-wise, uh, are, are, are there any that you can think, you know what, I can see this young man coming through and and really making an impression uh, in the professional ranks? I have to be honest with you in terms of guys who are amateurs at this point. I haven't followed it well enough because, again, it's so diminished. Uh, I gave the example, the New York Golden Gloves, which is now in disarray itself. They now call it the Metropolitan. There's a dispute about who owns the rights to use the word Golden Gloves. Would draw 19,000 people. In the last tournament, I think in the end, they drew about 900 people. And so they did not used to have a TV show every week in America. Yes. Yeah, show the golden gloves. Yeah, you'd have amateur boxing all the time. It was pervasive here. I mean, you could hide. When I first went to boxing, you know, I, I remember going to see it. Uh, there were golden glove tournament going on a high school in a, in a city high school. And we would go, you know, every neighborhood would have the kids from there was so many guys involved going into the tournaments that every neighborhood would have, you know, part of the tournament. And it would open up with maybe 64 rounds. Now it's over with, you know, three rounds. So it's so such a sea change in that kind of a situation there. 
that, uh, you know, and uh, there's a lot of junior Olympics. I mean, there was a fighter that turned pro a couple of years ago, Brandon Lee. It was very high. I mean, he won junior mm-hmm. Olympics and he was excellent. Now he's only about 21. Now he's undefeated in about 24 fights. But even he didn't wait to go into the Olympics. I guess they felt that there's just not enough cachet in it, you know, to hold it that a gold medal really makes that much difference anymore. I mean, I honestly, I'm in the business, you're in the business. I can't let, name the last the gold medalist to win in the in the, the most recent Olympics. Now, mm-hmm. shame on me, I could be more you know, vigilant in, in my my studying that, but that would be imprinted on my mind. I remember, you know, when George Foreman turned pro and it was such a big thing. We had the politics in 68 with the, you know, uh, the, the people, the, the black athletes asserting themselves and forming somebody just handed him a flag and he waved it around the ring after he won the Olympic gold medal. And he turned pro in a six round bout, which was real, it was quite unprecedented on the Frazier quarry card in Madison Square Garden. Wow. Yeah. So he walked wow. right into it. And Sugar Ray Lennon turned pro on national television and drew $72,000. I remember in an armory in Washington, D.C., which in those days, you know, What's 40 years ago would be like 500,000 today. Mm. So these guys were instant stars and you knew about them before they had a pro fight. I can't honestly, and again, I'll criticize myself for not being more aware, recall any Olympic gold medalist in the last Olympics. I don't know who it was. I'm sure people do. I'm sure they turn pro, but I can't at the top of my head tell you who it was. Well, who are three guys on the American team, for example, John, from the last Olympics. A seesaw of the Olympic, uh, Olympians, the gold that they were. The, the most powerful country when it comes to the Olympics and boxing, mm-hmm. where would you say that? Would you say East European or, or mm-hmm. America, Cuba, uh, mm-hmm. the UK? Where would you say the, 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 the crop of successful Olympians are coming through at the moment? Where, where are the medals sitting? Yeah, I, I would see the, you know, the Eastern Europeans, and it's different also. I don't think every country now sends a, an Olympic team. I think it's broken down by regions, and certain regions gets precedence. I think Cuba gets to send its own team, irrespective, and then have like a North American team, and I don't know how the British work there, or the European team. So instead of you know, having you know, eight or ten boxes coming from any one country, you have that. That's diminished, too. So I think that system is poor as well. You know, we need more participants, not less participants, even if you can't field a full team. You know, maybe America can send flyweights that could compete or Japan would be able to send heavyweights, but they should be able to send a full roster if they want, not, you know, picked and choose. I think that, yeah, I think the they needed a real reboot with how Olympic boxing was arranged. I, I believe that's hurt greatly in the, in, in the way that it's uh that it's been presented and the prestige that goes along with winning a silver or bronze or a gold medal. Don, just a quick one uh, while it comes to mind. Did, 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 did Olympics influence social change or did social change influence the Olympics? You know, you'd look at the likes of Muhammad Ali uh, throwing his medal in the, in the river because he was still treated like a second-class, third-class right. citizen. Right. Then right. you go on to George Foreman, who was, who was glorified with his, with his gold medal book. Then in '68, it was a black house. It was a sign of the times. And then right. you'd move even further forward and look at the likes of a Mexican like Oscar De La Hoya, mm-hmm. and they realize how much revenue somebody like that could bring to the game. Mm-hmm. Do you think again, social change or change or, 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 or the attitudes of boxing change? Which one was it? Well, you know, I, as I said, I think a lot of the Olympics, uh, when it's set, television started, a lot of the impact was the. The, the, the rivalry between communism and capitalism, between democracy and autocracy, the East and the West, you know, the Soviet bloc and the West, and particularly the United States. But then we started having internal politics that intruded into it. As you say, when uh, Cassius Clay, as he was called at that time, you know, got the Olympic gold medal and he went back home and he couldn't eat at a lunch counter in Louisville, Kentucky, which was a southern state, and threw his, his uh, gold medal in the, in, in the river, which became no much far after he, you know, after he had that fight. And it's a bit of a, maybe a legendary story. But, and then Foreman, when uh, he tells the story that in 68 with the, you know, the, the cognizance of black power and the whole social revolution taking place in the US, somebody just thrust a, a flag into his hand and he marched around the ring, but it was adopted by people who may have had a political belief, say, hey, look at the patriotism George showed. And it was blown up and it would greatly benefited him. And as we moved along, it wasn't just black and white fires, it was fighters of different ethnicities, uh, you know, started to use the Olympics to get out and in, in front, uh, you know, in the United States. And you bring up Oscar De La Hoya was a Mexican-American who really was the first to win a gold medal. And they become the dominant ethnic group in the United States in boxing. So I think, yeah, as it's changed over the years, I think it's been adopted uh, 
and used, uh, I'm not, and I, I don't say used in a bad sense or exploited in a bad sense, but allowed these people to, to, to move forward from different groups of individuals that you know, have been overlooked and to grab this immediate kind of attention, the immediate kind of fame and, and use that financially where promoters then say, wow, this, this guy's a Mexican American, he's gonna be something hot. Or now maybe the next great influx are gonna be Asian Americans who will start to come into uh, fruition as uh, Olympic champs. So I said, yeah, of course, it's a, it's a reflection of the social situation in the, in the larger uh, political realm in any country. I believe that so much. Sounds like money can be very persuasive to uh, mm. the powers to be when needed to be. No, oh, absolutely. Money runs everything and everybody else runs after it. And finally, Don, yeah, what's your thoughts on uh, the professionals that can go back to boxing amateur if they've had, I think it's less than half a dozen fights. What's your opinion on that? Look, my initial opinion on when they did it with all the other sports, basketball and hockey, and this was ridiculous. I'm mean, supposed to be to some degree, again, as I said, with the Soviet bloc and communism, they were sub their guys were ostensibly professionals playing against our amateurs. That's why that win by the American Olympic team was so great. You know, I said, here's 18 year old Americans playing the ice hockey. Olympics and they beat these seasoned Russian 40 year old Russians who've been playing hockey and they have a four, you know, 20 years. They're the equivalent of a Wayne Gretzky or Gordie Howe or Bobby Hall yeah. you know, who'll be in the NHL playing professionally for 20 years. These guys were the same. So it was remarkable. Now I said, you have the team, I don't know, some team from Burkina Faso playing against the, uh, you know, the greatest basketball players in the world who are making $40 million a year. And they're playing these guys who, you know, are 16, 18 year old kids and winning 100 points to 20. I mean, it's a slaughter. But being in a boxing, I think we should be given the same opportunity of if a pro wants to go back to the amateurs and fight, if Joshua wants to go back and now fight as an amateur or, or you know, Canelo never was in the Olympics, but he wants to go back and do it. I think they've made it to the point. That's another thing as well. The, the, the input of professionals and amateurs, I think that's diminished the Olympics. But why should boxing be deprived? Why should only boxers not be allowed to box? I think it should be open. They want to go box. If you're making it, I'm just not saying a farce, but if every other sport can do it, professional hockey players and professional basketball players, professional baseball players can do it. Why are we depriving boxers from the opportunity to say, I have won a gold medal? I do think it's going to be completely diminish that. I mean, if Floyd Mayweather you know, had gone back after he was world champ and fought a 16-year-old kid, his winning the Olympics is not as important when he did it when he was 18. So it, I know it's commercialization, but I, I, I'm just, I'm for it. If they, if they want to let everybody in, you can't deny boxing. You know, I, I, yeah, yeah, I do get that. I think probably, as you say, in our own sport, we shoot ourselves in the foot. And individuals, not the, the, the athlete, the participant, mm -hmm. is probably because individuals benefit, a promoter will benefit, or, mm -hmm. or a, a certain TV company will benefit if they've already, if they've already, being professional and they've got a manager, they've got a promoter and they put them back to the Olympics. Maybe that is that an individual outside benefits outside of the athlete himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Don, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, uh, intriguing once again. Uh, always blow my mind with your information and where it comes from. Uh, born and bred. Thank you. And uh, I'll see you again next week. Thanks, John. My pleasure.